This is chapter 12 of the American government class talking about interest groups, very integral part of our democratic representative society. Let's talk about, first of all, what the basic definitions are. Interest groups are what we call the organized benefit seekers in our society. There's power to being organized, as we've talked about a little bit before. I've already interest, introduced you to interest groups in a previous class when we looked at uh, what groups have the most influence on policy making, interest groups being one of those groups. And you might say that it's the squeaky wheel gets the grease type syndrome with people organize and mobilize and collect dues and raise funds and use those funds for various activities to influence government. Well, they're the ones that are going to get the most attention. This is what we call the system of pluralism in America. Policy is driven by these competing groups. And these interest groups are what we might call the workhorses of political advocacy because they're the ones that are getting the most attention or they're working the hardest to get the attention of government to try to get benefits for my group. So anyone in America has the right to join an interest group and then therefore you would pool your resources and increase your power to potentially influence government to pass policy that is going to help you and your group. This is also part of what we call the Iron Triangle of policy making. Now it's considerably more complicated than this, but the three main prongs of policy making are the congressional committees and the party influence that we've talked about quite a bit before when we looked at Congress, the executive agencies that are part of this policy making function, particularly with the rules and the regulations, and then the interest groups and their lobbyists, which are involved in all phases of the process in order to try to get the policies that they want passed that are going to benefit their groups. That's why they're called pressure groups as well. Let's look at the three basic types of interest groups. And by far, the most predominant and most powerful type of interest group are what we'll call the economic groups. These include the corporations, the businesses, the financial organizations, the unions, the professional associations. So a corporation such as Microsoft or Amazon or Google, they are their own interest groups because they are so profitable and so powerful that they can use those profits in order to lobby or to use that for campaign contributions in order to try to get the attention of government or to work with government to try to get policies that are going to help them, give them advantages that will accumulate so that they can increase their revenue, maximize their profit. Financial organizations such as banks, unions a little bit to a lesser extent because they are representing the workers. Professional associations, there's a professional association that represents almost every profession out there in the United States. We'll look at a few example of examples here in a little bit. The economic interest groups have ample resources because they are collecting revenues with whatever, whatever product or, or service that they are selling. They are making a profit and they're concerns are with increasing that revenue and maximizing that profit or if you are a if you have shares then you want to maximize your shareholder value as well so those are fairly narrow concerns and they've got lots of resources to try to to focus on those and they by far dominate the interest group system because they can for the most part and that's also a lot of ammunition for political cartoonists to to look at as far as this disparity between this influence of the normal average working person or consumer as opposed to the the advantages that the corporations have for example in their access to government looking at 
several examples of professional associations here. As you can see, this is just a small smattering of thousands of examples out there. Many of these I'm sure you've probably heard of, National Association of Realtors, American Medical Association, National uh, Auto Dealers Association, American Council of Engineering Companies. So if there's a profession out there that's got people working for it that need to make a living and with companies that uh, are trying to make a profit, then there is a professional association or a trade group, sometimes is what they're called, trade associations, and their sole focus is to help that particular industry, whether it's the realtors, or whether it's bankers, or whether it's teachers. Their job is to represent that profession as a whole and try to make sure that they are recognized by the government and get benefits from the government in order to improve their situations. Second type of interest group is what we call institutional groups. And these are the governments and nonprofits that are actively defending political strategic interests. They are not necessarily profit-seeking groups, otherwise they would be economic groups. So what they are looking for, if they are a government agency or a state and local government, they are looking to get bigger budgets. They are looking for research grants from the government. They are looking for aid packages from the government. So these are bureaucratic agencies. We'll talk about an example here in a minute where the Navy has its own, what you might call its, its legislative representative group that lobbies Congress in order to make sure that the Navy continues to get funding to, to do what it needs to do. The universities are the examples of institutional groups that kind of kick-started the modern era of lobbying to where Har Harvard and Yale, for example, had been fairly effective at getting some influence on government in order to get some grants, in order to get some uh, perhaps some research hospitals built that would add prestige. This was back in the 60s and the 70s, and it turned out to be such a profitable an endeavor. What I mean by that is that only cost them, compared to what they were going to get in return, it didn't cost them a whole lot to try to hire somebody, in this case a lobbyist, to work with government to try to get that aid package inserted into a big bill and the, the benefits that those universities got from the amount that they invested into it was tremendous return on that. So it, it sounded like this is a good idea. The cities um, are always looking for help from state and federal governments. New York City lobbies quite heavily in state and federal government to get aid to uh, conduct its business. Even foreign countries looking in to the United States government to help them with aid packages. There's lots of institutional groups out there that are looking to federal government to benefit them. International organizations, NGOs, non-governmental organizations, whether it's Human Rights Watch, Greenpeace, Doctors Without Borders, there's lots of NGOs out there that rely on voluntary contributions as well as funding from from grants, research grants, things like that. So those are the institutional groups, not quite as influential as economic groups. Promotional groups, third type, these are the type of interest groups that you've probably heard of and recognize as what we would consider interest groups that get a lot of attention. And these are the groups where people like you and me, for the most part, regardless of what company you work for, if you've got your own interests as far as how to make the world a better place, you can get with other people and organize around some idea or issue or point of view. And then once you organize, then you have more power with that organization where you can get more members and collect dues and use those resources to influence government. So there's lots of 
these types of interest groups where they recognize ethnic groups or religious groups, foreign policy groups, environmental groups, recreational groups. There's just so many different causes and interests out there that, that people are joined together for. These are just just a smattering of examples that you've probably heard of, the NRA, National Rifle Association, which is quite influential, particularly with respect to gun rights, gun control. The AARP represents senior citizens, which is one of the biggest and most powerful lobbies because there's a lot of people in the United States that are over 60. You only have to be over 50, I believe, in order to be a member of ARP, they'll probably take take anybody, but they have a a massive budget and lots of people that are members of AARP, so they can use that to get government's attention. Sierra Club is a an environmental group, NAACP, represents minority rights, American Legion, and VFW, they represent veterans, Common Cause is a group that um, looks at trying to keep an eye on corruption in government, focus on family, is a group that looks that promotes family values. APAC is a good example, represents Israel and the and the Jewish Americans. It's American Israel Political Action Committee. In order to make sure that America recognizes the rights of the Jewish people in America as well as recognizing Israel is a very strong ally to the United States. So those are just a few examples of promotional groups. What are the basic concerns with interest groups? Groups that can that can do these things, and there's a lot of negative connotations with what interest groups do. But the bottom line is, is that you and I could could join any interest group and and we would use that to help us get some advantages for our particular profession or our particular interests. The problems, however, is that not all interests are equally well organized, and we've already talked about how the economic groups dominate the interest group system because they can, and it's the producer interests that overwhelm the consumer interests. The producers, we're talking about the businesses, the corporations, those professional and trade associations, they make a lot up a large majority of all interest groups, as well as a vast majority of the spending, particularly with campaign contributions and lobbying. The consumers, on the other hand, such as you or I that go out and want to buy products, particularly big ticket items such as home or buying cars, well, those groups represent only about 3% of all the total of interest groups out there in the country. So as you can see, not well, there's not as much incentive for consumers to get together, just as there was not that much of an incentive for middle-class people to come together and form an interest group. This is what we call the theory of collective action, is why these, these smaller, more focused interests, such as economic interests, are more logical to come together, whereas big, huge groups like consumers in the middle class, there's much less incentive to, to create a group, and you'd have a lot more free riders with that type of group as well. But the reason why it works so well is that the, the benefits that these corporations are receiving are they're paid for by the consumers for the most part. Households, for example, pay about $40 more per year on average for sugar as a result of quotas and import restrictions. And that the reason why that works fairly well is that most people, such as myself, don't even realize that we could be paying $40 more per year on sugar. I don't even look at the price. I just go to that aisle and I go to that shelf and I just throw that sugar that I always buy into my cart, regardless of how much it costs. But if the government took away those import restrictions and lowered that price, well, the sugar producers, which is a very small number of them, and again, it's an oligopolistic system that's fairly normal in, in human societies, those relatively small handful of sugar producers would really feel that hit, lose quite a bit, uh, millions and millions of dollars of additional revenue, 
as a result of that having to compete with cheaper producers in uh, other countries. So they literally would be screaming bloody murder, and that's why it's in their interest to use these additional profits that they're making to invest into lobbying the government to keep up those import restrictions, those quotas, in order to better enable them to compete with the foreign producers. And at the same time, the consumers are the ones that are generally paying for that, not even really realizing that they're paying for it. So that's one reason why it, it is fairly effective for them to do that. Some groups, whether it's economic or proportional or promotional groups, have a disproportionate voice. We know that business groups, because they have more money and more power of organization, particularly if you are a big corporation and you form a political action committee and then you can require your employees to uh, take a few money, a few dollars out of their monthly or their weekly paycheck and put it in the political action committee, well, then you've got a guaranteed source of revenue for your political contributions. And the corporate political influence has been gaining power over the past few years because it's kind of a, a cumulative advantage. Once uh, government provides benefits or tax breaks or subsidies, to corporate influences, then they get those advantages. And because of those advantages, they can make more profits and gain more power, and they can use that to gain more advantages. Some promotional groups in particular can distort public opinion with a much louder voice, even though they may only be representing a fairly small minority of the population. We see that example, particularly in maybe some fundamentalist religious groups, the gun rights groups, where when you see a vast majority of Americans that are okay with passing gun control measures such as waiting periods and background checks, but yet those very rarely get passed, particularly not on the federal level because of the pressure that the gun rights groups can exert on that. Cultural associations, even though they may represent a fairly small minority population, but they have a louder voice in order to uh, speak out against discrimination, things like that. Another concern is the group leaders of these interest groups are not necessarily responsive to the members. In any oligopolistic type system, you've got a handful of insiders that, that form the core of these groups that dominates the direction and the, then uses the resources that they get from as many members as they can recruit. And in some cases, if a group can get relatively few wealthy donors to provide most of the funding, another one of these disproportionate advantages is if there are some super wealthy people out there that have a very ideological view, well, they can use that money to fund these, these pressure groups and promote policy or perhaps even distort policy a little bit to their favor just because they have... Uh, more power to do that. And these groups, much like any company that you work for, you don't get to elect your bosses. They're typically undemocratic, unelected, so the core group dominates there. One of the things that the bigger interest groups do is provide selective benefits in order to prevent the free riders from enjoying their, their work. A good example of this would be AARP. For example, if you are a retired person, you don't have to be a member of AARP to get the benefits that AARP might be pushing for, such as maintaining or increasing Medicare benefits or maintain or ensuring that Social Security benefits don't get taken away, things like that. So if you are over 65, you are already entitled to that. That's why it's called an entitlement. So you don't have to join AARP or pay them dues in order to get that benefit. So therefore, there could be lots of free riders that are enjoying the benefits of that work that somebody like AARP is doing. So what a group might do is to provide these little sweeteners to try to get people to join, and the dues are relatively cheap, I guess you could say, comparatively speaking. When you join these interest groups, you could get free advice, free information, free training programs, research that, for example, with AARP, they could provide lots of research on new 
pharmaceuticals and drugs that are coming out, uh, exercise programs, things to uh, in increase your longevity. Then there's other benefit plans such as co-insurance plans, pension plans, discounts. There's lots of senior citizen discounts out there that AARP has probably con contributed to, uh, to getting. What are some major tactics that the interest groups do? Large groups can do what is called electoral activity, which is get their groups out to vote or to write their congressmen. So you could imagine that if there was a congressman that was looking to cut Social Security benefits, well, ARP could mobilize its members and have them all email that congressman at the same time and literally crash his computer, and that would certainly get his attention. But when you've got large numbers that could potentially vote against you, yes, that would make a difference. Economic activity is something that perhaps consumers and unions could do perhaps more than most. Or if you are a local business, you could threaten to move your business somewhere else, even on the corporate level with uh, increasing globalization of our economy. Multinational corporations can actually threaten the federal government to move or relocate and hire people elsewhere, so the federal government would be tending to then give them benefits so that they would stay and hire people in America. But as far as what consumers and workers might could do would be to go on strike so that their company is not doing any productive work or boycott certain products as a consumer if, you're, if you disagree with something that they're doing. Another thing that interest groups do are make campaign contributions. We've already talked about this a little bit before, but all politicians, congressmen, have to get reelected. House of Representatives, they get reelected every two years. Senators get reelected every six years. And they are increasingly in need of more and more finances to run their campaigns and to compete in the elections and make sure that they can get reelected. And people that want to challenge them have to raise money in order to get across a threshold to where they feel like that they can even compete with the incumbent. We've talked about those things. So wealthy donors and corporate entities can spend a lot of money on campaign contributions to help the politicians get reelected. And when they get reelected, then they'll say, okay, well, obviously I, I, I remember who contributed to my election campaign. And so it's a subtle indirect influence because no politician is just going to come out and say, well, yes, this company gave me a bunch of money, so I'm going to pass a bill that gives them benefits. Well, no, it doesn't work that way. The congressmen are very appreciative of getting money from anybody. And when they want to get reelected, they know that they want to rely on that for their next election. So that is in the back of their mind. So this is a relatively cheap influence that corporations and wealthy donors can make and get a return on their investment in influencing government policy. Public information campaigns to where interest groups can put out advertisements and, and uh, do commercials, uh, have rallies, all kinds of things that are interest group can do to get out information that the local government or even federal government is going to have to pay attention to. Litigation, there are groups such as the NAACP that uses litigation to, and the ACLU that goes through the courts and uses the courts to try to uh, influence government through case law and anti-discrimination type cases, things such as that. Now, the, the biggest and most effective tactic that particularly the economic interest groups can use, all groups use it, but we'll talk about how it is a f more effective potentially for economic groups, and that's lobbying, which you've probably heard all your life, but a lot of people are not quite sure what does lobbying mean, is it, and then a lot of uh, perceptions about how is this kind of like legalized bribery, things like that. Well, no, not really, but it there we do have to keep an eye on it, and it could cross the line into bribery. There have been 
some politicians who have been charged with, uh, with getting undue influence from lobbyists. But the bottom line is, is a very common and very, very effective tactic that interest groups use in order to work with the congressman to get policy passed that's going to help them out. So a lobbyist is a person who is either hired or contracted by the interest group to represent them in Washington. Let's just say we're talking about federal government. And this is another kind of a distasteful aspect of it is that many of these lobbyists are former congressmen because they've been there, they've done that, they know where the bodies are buried, so to speak, former government officials, so they know how the system works and have connections and access in order to come back a couple of years after they're out of office and say, hey, let's go to lunch. I represent the American Medical Association. Let's talk about this new bill that's coming up. Very logical, rational behavior that any interest group would be looking to try to get this, this type of experience and influence to uh, work for them. Lobbying is more than just flashing money. You're not going to typically change a legislator's mind. You're going to be working with legislators that already are sympathetic to what you need. So you are going to provide whatever services they need, whatever input, information, help that would help them craft that policy. And in many cases, because the, the industry group has got more experience and more inside knowledge about how this may work, well, they can literally kind of provide rough drafts of the policy and then provide that to the congressman for them to sort out amongst themselves. So that's why it's a very powerful influence. The lobbyist is the congressman's ally on any particular proposal that that interest group is interested in. There's lots of reasons to lobby to protect the company against changes in government policy that could be harmful to that company or to that industry and to compete with other companies and with other countries perhaps because that's what protection is about is where your government is trying to help domestic industries in their competition with foreign countries and foreign industries. So seeking favorable changes in government in order to compete and maximize your profit and of course to maintain ongoing relationships and keeping that connection there as to whenever that influence is needed, whenever that input is needed from either direction. Got those connections, got those relationships intact. Again, lots of political cartoons that uh, would poke fun at this system that is been a long time evolving. It's an integral part of our system, good, bad, right or wrong. doesn't have really much to do with it. It's just how it works in the realm of rational behavior in our capitalist democratic system. And no congressman is going to stand up there and say, yeah, these people gave me money, so I am going to pass policy that is going to help them. No, nobody's going to say that. But it does have a Influence, a subtle, indirect influence that you can actually measure. It does work. Looking at the top spenders on lobbying in the 2016 presidential election cycle, these are the top 20. Uh, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce is always at the top of the list on spending for lobbying. They represent the small businesses of America. There's hardly a little town in America that doesn't have a little chamber of ch commerce office somewhere in that little town. So they are always out there looking out for the small business interests. And some of these we've already seen on the previous list earlier. We've got um, realtors, medical associations right there near the top, airline, broadcasters, cable groups, the uh, telecommunications groups. Alphabet, that's the parent company of Google. And Amazon cracked the top 20 there in the uh, 2016 election cycle. And what is common with all 20 of these top spenders 
on lobbying, every single one of them is an economic group. Looking at the top spenders in the midterm election cycle, 2018, we see some of the same faces here where Facebook actually cracked into the top right there. And out of this group, every single one of these is an economic group except for this one right here, which is an institutional group, nonprofit group that was that uh, picked up its activity quite a bit after the election of Donald Trump. Uh, they are looking at human rights, uh, pro-democracy type issues, things like that. Lobbyist provides several things for the congressman, technical expertise. They can provide analyses, studies, advice. The lobbyist has deep pockets, comparatively speaking. A lobbyist may have more in his own personal expense account than the congressman has for his entire staff. So that's, that can be used to the congressman's advantage and say, yes, I, I can use all the help I can get, so provide me with this, provide me with that, and then I'll take it upon advisement as far as how we use that to craft legislation. And the lobbyist, as I said, can even provide drafts of legislation that Congress can then take and revise as they see fit. The lobbyists are the ones that are more of the specialists on these policy areas because for most policies that's, that comes up in Congress, very few of the, in some cases, if any, of those congressmen are actually specialists on that particular policy that they are making law on. So they might actually have to rely on lobbyists to provide them more specialized information on how to figure this out, understand how this works. Bottom line, congressmen lack the time and the expertise to do what lobbyists can do for them. And even though they may not acknowledge that help in any way, uh, they are certainly appreciative of it. And it has, of course, that, that subtle indirect influence on getting those benefits to the interest groups. Here's an example, somewhat of a unique type of situation here where in January of 1992, President George H.W. Bush proposed to kill the Seawolf submarine program. This was two anti-Soviet subs, $2 billion each. So that was $4 billion that there was a general consensus because the Cold War was technically over. The Soviet Union had actually collapsed the year before. So there was no need for an anti-Soviet submarine. And that money could be rerouted to other military needs. But the, uh, the thing is, is that it had already been approved, so therefore policy had to be enacted to reroute those funds. There, in this case, there was a pretty strong consensus. Democrats had been pushing back against the Reagan and Bush eras for the previous 12 years on Cold War spending. Government spending had peaked during the Reagan administration. Democrats were always pushing back against that. And now we found uh, both parties on the same page for the most part because Republicans were in agreement that we didn't really need to spend this on anti-Soviet purposes. And the president was proposing this. So the Republican Party members were going to fall in line behind the president. So it didn't seem to be that big of a deal. However, Things started to happen fairly quickly. Now, look, let's focus on the Senate because this is where the most activity was, was working that we can look at. Senate was comprised of 55 Democrats, 45 Republicans. This was fairly uh, irrelevant because of the consensus on this issue to reroute that funding to some other military need. So this was considered a no-brainer when this was proposed in January of 1992. However, who is it that's going to be very, very worried when they hear that announcement? Well, the first group that would be worried would, of course, would be the manufacturer of those sub submarines. And that's where we'll start to see things happening behind the scenes fairly quickly. First of all, the uh, the interest group, General Dynamics, was very worried because that was a big chunk of revenue that they did not want to lose. So what we have here 
is we're going to be looking at the three prongs of this iron triangle and show how all three of them, almost working separately, lobbying either internally or externally in order to get a policy turned the way they want it to be turned. So the owner of General Dynamics was actually good friends. Talk about connections, relationships. He was good friends with the chairman of the Defense Appropriations Subcommittee. And the chairman, of course, said, well, I obviously can't do anything directly for you, but I can recommend you to a lobbying group. And that was this particular group right there. And the General Dynamics paid, I think it was about $100,000 per month to this group, Cassidy and Associates, to start doing the legwork that was needed to recruit people to get the word out, uh, to go door to door to congressmen to do studies. They actually did a study that showed how many states had people that were working, whether it was through subcontractors or technological suppliers, whatever. They, they literally went and found almost all 50 states had certain amounts of companies that were contributing to this huge submarine project. So therefore, they could go to all these senators and say, hey, wait a minute, you've got constituents that are going to be affected. They also started media campaigns and what you would call the uh, training programs for, for testifying. They also created their own submarine construction council. They actually created another interest group in order to raise funds, in order to to try to promote the construction of these submarines. Now, on the congressman's side, almost immediately, there was two states that were going to be affected by the killing of this bill, and that was Connecticut and Rhode Island, because those are the states where those two submarines, $4 billion worth of work, was going to be done. So the senators from those two states, particularly uh, Dodd and Joseph Lieberman, they got working immediately because they felt like this could be very a uh, serious hit to their constituents. So they started recruiting allies in the Senate. They kind of broke protocol and started going and knocking door to door and trying to get support to keep this, this issue going. They uh, organized hearings. They had reports made in order to talk about the value of these submarines, how they could still be needed. They did this log rolling, this deal making where they went and said, if you support me on this particular bill, I will support you down the road on this bill that you've got in your state. And then the agency, this is the Naval Office of Legislative Affairs, they were also interested in keeping this program intact because those funds could be actually directed out of the Navy. So the Navy was very interested in maintaining this project. And so NOLA actually recru recruited a former admiral who really had no uh, dog in that hunt, who uh, testified before Congress and gave a very strong testimony on the value of the submarines and the, the need to go ahead and make them and have them uh, perhaps even retrofitted to modern needs, but still be on the ready because we, no, no guarantee that this Cold War is completely over. What, whatever the argument took. So you had all of these, all of these groups working, not necessarily coordinated, because General Dynamics had its own interest in keeping the project going. The senators from those two states had their own self-interests in mind to try to keep that project going, and the Naval Office there had its own self-interest in trying to keep that project going, but they were all working and synergistically, it actually made a difference because even though this was considered originally a no-brainer that this would certainly get passed, well, look what happened by the vote in May, so this is only less than five months later, we see that particularly the Democrats organized, which is ironic because they had been opposed to Cold War spending for several years prior to that, but because of the lobbying efforts 
of General Dynamics, the Naval Office, as well as the uh, Democrat uh, senators there in those states, and one of them was a Republican senator. But as you can see, they turned the vote around, and the Senate actually voted to save the Seawolf. So this is a classic example of how this lobbying works to craft policy into what is going to benefit your particular group. And we're, we're looking at three different groups there, an institutional group, as well as a promotion, as well as an economic group, as well as the internal workings of the senators themselves. So there's lots of examples out there. In 2007, the House Ways and Means proposed to raise taxes on hedge fund managers from 15 to 35 percent. That had been a fairly popular measure to uh, tax that, uh, you know, comparatively huge wealth. But the lobbying by the finance industry doubled in the year that that legislation was being formed, and the lobbying assisted in blocking that plan to raise those uh, taxes on those on that particular group. In 2008, the National Association of Home Builders used some leverage here, had $825,000 on hand, and they stopped giving donations in order to get Congress's attention. Within weeks, the House Banking Committee then added tax credit to first-time homebuyers. And what's really ironic about this is that this is on the cusp of the housing crisis, the uh, mortgage debt bubble that a lot of economists were already predicting. And here, Congress was contributing to that by getting more people into buying homes that perhaps could not afford it, because that's kind of what triggered the recession. So this was stimulating home buying just as the subprime mortgage bubble was about to burst. So that is an interesting example of how lobbying can cause Congress to do something in spite of what uh, experts are saying what they perhaps shouldn't be doing. More examples. The American pizza community, that's another economic interest group that represents the pizza industry, gave $1.5 million to Republicans. That was vast majority of the total to fight mandatory menu labeling laws, particularly in schools. And what we see is that Pizza, as long as it has tomato paste on it, still remains classified by the USDA as a vegetable. In addition, large food companies spent $5.5 million in 2011 against new nutrition guidelines in school cafeterias. The US, this is uh, one that just came out not too long ago. The U.S. meat industry lobbyists convinced 12 state legislatures just last year to ban products from using words like burger and meat if they don't come from animals. So this is a, the, the meat industry is kind of fighting back against the, this uh, increasing interest in the beyond meat type products. Now it doesn't always work. The American Beverage Association spent $38 million during the 2017 fall elections to fight several local ballot proposals to tax soft drinks. Those are some of the cities where those were being held, but they lost all of those. Lobbying doesn't always work. The revolving door, we already talked about that, of the influence industry is something that people find a little bit distasteful. In, for example, between 1998 and 2004, 50% of senators and 42% of representatives who had left then became lobbyists. So it's a very attractive job opportunity for former, for former government officials. In 2008, 310 former Bush appointees then became lobbyists when they left government. So that's fairly rational behavior that, that industries would hire former government officials to lobby on their behalf and because of the connections and the experience they already have. In addition, last year, 64 former congressmen, and this is split almost right down the middle, sat on corporate boards earning an average of $357,000 a year. And if you're familiar with corporate boards, well, they do not meet 
on a fairly regular basis. They may at, meet at most once a month, sometimes even less than that. So that's not a bad gig to get after uh, leaving government. There's more money that's deemed more and more necessary to win elections. We talked about that. We looked at some of those committees. We talked about the super PACs. We're seeing that more and more money is being spent with each election, particularly each major four-year election cycle, in order to for people to get elected. And it, it is a very disproportionate uh, spending here. Uh, about one half of 1% of the U.S. adult population contributed about 71% of all campaign contributions in that last election cycle. So that shows you how the, the wealthier citizens are providing the overwhelming bulk of these campaign contributions and seeing more benefits as a result of that. And going back to 1998, we see a significant increase in every election cycle and in 2020, more than this. And you could perhaps ask yourself, despite the fact that we're spending more and more money to elect our politicians, are we getting better politicians for that money? That's a good question to ask. This influence industry has some rational reasons as to why it has grown as it has. As government gets bigger, government takes on more responsibility. Human beings need and want more from government. So therefore, there's more and more of a need for a facilitator to navigate that government, to help you access that government, to get things from government. Created by ordinary people responding logically to powerful incentives. And even the lobbying industry itself is aware of their negative connotation. The American League of Lobbyists, which is the professional association for lobbyists, they recently changed their name to the Association of Government Relations Professionals in order to hopefully uh, improve their image uh, a little bit. So therefore, the lobbyists for lobbyists then has changed their name to government relations professionals for government relations professionals. So that concludes the video lecture for interest groups. Stay tuned for discussion forum.